Good morning. Good to have you all here. The meeting will come to order. Today, the Military Personnel Subcommittee will hold a hearing on the organization of the Office of the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Health Affairs. It's important to note that the Office of the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Health Affairs has a unique organization within the Department of Defense. It's the only merger of an Assistant Secretary's Office and a defense activity or agency, in this case, the TRICARE Management Activity. In every other instance we can find, a defense agency or activity is a standalone entity, usually with a three-star or SES director and a two-star SES deputy or vice director. The agency or activity falls under the Office of Secretary of Defense Office, and the director reports to the OSD official, such as an undersecretary, an assistant secretary, or a deputy undersecretary. But the two staffs in all those instances are separate and distinct. In health affairs, however, the assistant secretary is also the director of the TRICARE management activity. Each of the health affairs deputy assistant secretaries are also dual hatted as the TRICARE management activity division chiefs. And finally, if we've confused everybody by now. <laughs> Finally, last year, the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Health Affairs was also designated as the Principal Deputy Director of the TRICARE Management Activity. And this new position actually has no corollary in other defense agencies or activities. And frankly, its role has not yet been fully explained. So as a result, the role of the two-star deputy director of the TRICARE management activity to many people is not exactly clear, and we're here to help you explain uh, that to us. In all of the other OSD offices that have a defense agency or activity underneath them, the under or assistant secretary staff develops policy and provides oversight, while the agency or activity staff is responsible for executing that policy. This structure is the result of hard lessons learned with built-in checks and balances. In health affairs, one set of people is responsible for both sets of functions. And in fact, few refer colloquially to either health affairs or the TRICARE management activity separately. They are simply known as the health affairs slash TRICARE management activity or HATMA. So with HATMA, we are clearly dealing with a different model than the rest of the department. And we do not know if that's a good different, if it's a bad different, or just different. It's therefore important for us to examine exactly how the HATMA is organized and operates today. And then, most significantly, how that impacts the care we provide to our men and women in uniform, and isn't really that the bottom line here that we're seeking. Our hearing will seek to answer the following questions. What is the current organizational structure of health affairs TRICARE management activity? What are the current roles and responsibilities of health care man uh, TRICARE management activity? And is this unique structure that we've referred to appropriate to the roles and responsibilities of the office? What is the organizational relationship between HATMA and the services? Does that current organizational structure support the requirements of the services most significantly? And are there any plans to reorganize HATMA? And if so, what would that new organizational look like? How does the department plan to deal with the Joint Medical Command Headquarters RAC recommendation? For our witness panel today, we have all the key players from the military health system. First is the individual to whom Health Affairs reports, the Acting Undersecretary of Defense for Personnel and Readiness, Ms. Gail McKinn. Ms. McKinn has been the Acting Undersecretary for just a few weeks now, so we understand the difficulty uh, of being here today, but we appreciate it very much and we look forward to the discussion with you. Next is the Acting Assistant Secretary of Defense for Health Affairs, Ms. Ellen Embry. And this is actually Ms. Embry's first day as the Acting Assistant Secretary. So congratulations to you. Uh, you may not be feeling that way afterwards, but we're, we're very happy to have you with us as well. 
I understand that you'll be testifying also this afternoon um, before our counterpart subcommittee in the Senate. We also have all of the service surgeon generals here today, and we certainly welcome you again, and we know that we've had an opportunity to meet with you in the past. Lieutenant General James Routerbush from the Air Force, Vice Admiral Adam Robinson from the Navy, Lieutenant General Eric Schoonmaker from the Army, to get the service perspectives on the current HATMA organizational structure. And finally, we're very delighted and uh, fortunate to have the Deputy Director of the TRICARE Management Activity, Major General Granger here today as well. General, I understand that this is your last week. We have a few <laughs> milestones here today. <laughs> your last week as the Deputy Director and that you'll be returning shortly after several decades uh, in uniform to the, public, to the private sector. And we certainly wish you well in your service uh, moving forward and we thank you very, very much for your contribution to our country. So that's my introduction, and I want to turn to my colleague, Mr. Wilson, who wants to welcome you as well. Mr. Wilson. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Today, the subcommittee meets to hear testimony from the Department of Defense and the service medical leadership regarding the current organizational structure of the military health system, MHS. I want to welcome our witnesses, and I look forward to their testimony. A robust military medical system is essential to the health and well-being of our armed forces. General George Washington and the Continental Congress understood the necessity of good medical care during the fight for our independence. After suffering a sizable number of casualties from disease, the Continental Congress established the Medical Department of the Army in July 1775. Washington then appointed the first Director General and Chief Physician of the Hospital of the Army. Since that time, our military medical system has provided care for the sick and injured during times of war and maintain the medical readiness of service members in peacetime. America expects nothing less. With that being said, I want to make sure that the military health system is structured and organized to continue to provide world-class health care today and in the future. I'm interested in hearing from our witnesses today how the military health system is organized to carry out its multiple health care missions of maintaining medical readiness capabilities, providing peacetime health care to eligible beneficiaries, providing battlefield medicine to our brave men and women in Iraq and Afghanistan in the global war on terrorism, and caring for those brave men and women through the long recovery process when they become injured or wounded. I am personally interested as a grateful father of four sons currently serving in the military today, including uh, one of my sons is a Navy Doctor Admiral, so I'm um, particularly proud of what you're, what y'all are doing, and what you're achieving uh, for the young people uh, who have the opportunity to serve in the military. Is there a better way to structure the system as we look to the future? Are there opportunities to build on initiatives such as the Joint Task Force Capital Medicine that was established to implement the base realignment and closure requirements in the National Capital Region? I look forward to hearing from the uniform leadership with us today, how they view the organization and structure of the MHS, and if it helps or hinders their ability to carry out their responsibility to provide medical care to all of our beneficiaries. Before I close, I would like to recognize and congratulate Major General Elder Granger on his upcoming retirement from the Army. General Granger has served this nation and our service members with distinction for over 32 years, and I was happy to point out to him he topped me by a year. I was in 31, so I'm, I'm very, very grateful for your service. Also want to alert you that we do have a condominium at Hilton Head. Uh, there's one left, and so you'd be welcome uh, to, to come to South Carolina. I sincerely thank you for your service and wish you the best in your future ende endeavors. God bless you. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Thank, <coughs> thank you, Mr. Wilson. And uh, now, uh, Ms. McGinn, would you please begin? And then we'll, we'll, go, we'll go right down the line. And I, we are, I think we've told you that you have five minutes. We hope you can uh, stick to that since we have a large panel and we certainly have a, a number of questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chairman, members of the committee, and thank you for the opportunity to be with you today to discuss the military <laughs> health system organization. I have submitted a written statement um, for the record. 
Healthcare, of course, plays a pivotal role in sustaining the all-volunteer force and its readiness. As we continue to respond to the realities of the post-911 world, the department remains firmly focused on the health and well-being of our forces and their families, particularly the wounded, ill, and injured, and to ensuring that all DOD beneficiaries receive the highest quality, most accessible, and cost-effective health services available. As you noted, I am here performing the duties of the Under Secretary of Defense for Personnel and Readiness. But the Under Secretary of Defense for Personnel and Readiness exercises authority, direction, and control over the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Health Affairs. He or she develops policies, plans, and programs for health and medical affairs to provide health services and support to members of the armed forces, their families, and others entitled to or determined eligible for Department of Defense care. The Undersecretary also ensures that policies and programs are designed and managed to improve standards of performance, economy, and efficiency, and that service providers are responsive to the requirements of their organizational customers. Among other things, in exercising these responsibilities, the Undersecretary reviews the overall status of the military health system, chairs the Military Health System Executive Review, which is the department's senior health care advisory body, which represents the stakeholder perspective, and he or she also chairs the congressionally mandated Joint Medical Readiness Council. Over the last five years, Congress has enacted many new programs, directed BRAC implementation, and expanded our requirements to care for wounded warriors. At the same time, the department has been asked to reduce health care costs while increasing efficiencies. In response, the department has taken significant steps to improve unity of effort. For example, the Deputy Secretary of Defense established the Joint Command for the National Capital Area. Joint Task Force Capital Medical, JTF CapMed, achieved full operating capability on 30 September 2008 and is meeting BRAC milestones for the creation of the Walter Reed National Military Medical Center at Bethesda. For healthcare delivery in the San Antonio multi-service market, all governance decisions are accomplished in a joint collaborative manner to further enhance a culture of increased jointness and interoperability. Brook Army Medical Center and the Air Force's Wilfrid Hall Medical Center have already completed an inpatient business plan for the new San Antonio Military Medical Center and are currently reviewing their integrated manpower needs and synchronizing construction with their transition schedule. The department is also standing up the Joint Medical Education and Training Campus in San Antonio, Texas to improve the quality and consistency of training of all enlisted personnel. Under the Base Realignment and Closure Act, the department is proceeding with plans to co-locate the me medical headquarters activities mm -hmm. of Health Affairs, TRICARE Management Activity, the Army Medical Command, Navy Bureau of Medicine, and Air Force Medical Service. This co-location will increase unity of effort in policy strategy and financial programming and yield greater consistency across the services and program execution, we believe. Madam Chairwoman, the ultimate goal for the Undersecretary of Personnel and Readiness is to ensure a predictable, reliable, robust, effective, superior quality and readily accessible health care benefit for the DOD population. The testimony you will hear from my colleagues, Ms. Ellen Embry and Deputy Director of uh, TRICARE Management Activity will provide greater detail about their roles and responsibilities in these areas. Together, we continue to do all we can to improve the lives and health of those in our care. We thank you for your generous support of military men and women and their families, and we look forward to your questions. Thank you. Please, Ms. Embry. Madam Chairwoman, members of the committee, uh, thank you for the opportunity to respond to your request for information and to present the current uh, military health systems organization and government. I have it on. Could you, you, could you move a little, it, closer? Yes, a little closer? Thank, thank you. Um, to present um, the current military health systems organizational and governance structure. Title 10 of the U.S. Code defines the key leadership roles and responsibilities of the organizations that comprise the military health system. Most of the organizations are represented here today. Ms. McGinn, uh, Major General Granger, and I represent the organizations from within the Office of the Secretary of Defense. When I arrived in Health Affairs in January of 2002 at a lower level, I was one of the four Deputy Assistant Secretaries in Health Affairs. At that time, there was a clear division of role and responsibility between the Office of Health Affairs and the supporting activity, TRICARE Management Activity. Those structures were established in the, the late 1990s as an outcome of defense reform initiatives to control the rising cost of health care services 
to improve access to care for the beneficiary population and to increase the consistency and quality of health care across the department. The initiatives capped the Office of the Secretary of Defense and Service Headquarters staff and realigned the majority of the former health affairs staff into the newly formed TRICARE management activity. Today, health affairs staff remains capped at 42 military and civilian personnel. Its primary responsibility is to advise the Secretary of Defense on all health matters and to develop department-wide policies and programs consistent with the department's health care and medical readiness needs. TRICARE's primary responsibility is to execute defense-wide programs, services, and contracts that improve access, quality, and consistency of health care services and to enable the services to perform. Today's TRICARE workforce numbers more than uh, 1,350 personnel worldwide. The military surgeons general lead and manage organizations and facilities that develop, enhance, and execute the services medical programs, and they guide joint operating programs in a lead or executive agent role. The joint staff and the geographic and functional combatant commanders also have surgeons general who advise them on contingency operations health planning, patient movement and tracking, and theater health delivery services in commands around the globe. Since September 11, 2001, the department has had to adapt to uh, several new environmental drivers that ex and very much expanded requirements, including increased national security threats and force health protection needs, and six years of continuous concurrent military operations in Iraq and Afghanistan, with all of the medical force protection and other services that those operations entail. Some 95,000 military medical personnel have deployed to support U.S. warfighters in addition to providing mandatory health deployment assessments and reassessments, increased psychological health programs and services, expanded research and treatment protocols to address traumatic injuries as well as wounded warrior rehabilitation and recovery programs, a new theater trauma registry and management program, and expanding and improving the electronic health systems. Further, the we have also engaged in the development, testing, and implementation of common cognitive assessment tools for field and baseline assessment. We also established a new Defense Center of Excellence for psychological health and traumatic brain injury to address other I that and other areas of urgent concern. We've conducted multiple global stabilization and reconstruction operations in response to catastrophic national disasters, natural disasters at home and abroad. We've plan to address a uh, strategically imminent threat of a global pandemic. We've promulgated and participated in international health regulations uh, to address the threats of bioterrorism. We have implemented new BRAC and QDR recommendations during that time frame to consolidate and align common functions. And we help support the medical aspects uh, and development of the new Africa Command with a global health mission. We have taken on other new and expanded areas of responsibility, which are detailed in my, rec uh, rec my testimony that's been submitted for the record. And uh, so we've had a lot of stuff we've been managing uh, in chaos for many years now. Um, in order to address that, an updated charter for the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Health Affairs was published in June of 2008. It recognized the need to organize to help manage uh, an MHS, which grew from $20 billion in 2002 to a $45 billion program in 2009. Madam Chairwoman, the world has changed dramatically since September 2011, and the MHS has had to evolve to meet its changing requirements. We do take a collaborative uh, leadership approach in making those governance decisions we work hard to develop win-win positions with our colleagues here at the table, and we engage on an ongoing basis on how to improve our focus for patient-centered care. We believe we have improved the efficiency and effectiveness of the military health system as an enterprise, and with your help and continuing support, we hope we will continue to do the same. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, General, you make your please speak. Madam Chairwoman, uh, Representative Wilson, distinguished members of uh, the Military Personnel Subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to discuss the organization of the military health system. First, 
I would like to take this uh, opportunity to publicly thank um, the Honorable uh, Dr. S. Ward Cassells for his years of uh, principled, passionate service as the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Health Affairs. We bid farewell to, to uh, Dr. Cassells last night. He's a friend, he's a mentor uh, whom I greatly re respect. Uh, his compassion and commitment to our service members and our families is, is un has been unparalleled. He's really one of my, one of our heroes at this table, and I, and I don't say that lightly. His team at Health Affairs and TRICARE Management Agency are hardworking and dedicated individuals, and I salute their, their service to the nation. Although the title of this hearing addresses the Organization of Health Affairs and uh, TMA, HATMA, I'm not really so interested in organizational structure. Um, as you cited, uh, Madam Chairwoman, in your uh, opening comments uh, and addressed in one of your questions, I'm far more concerned about the nature of the functional relationships between and among the stakeholders in the military health system, the MHS. To be more effective, form should always follow function. The function of the military health system must be, first and foremost, to support the warfighter on the battlefield. We must have trained and competent healthcare professionals delivering timely, effective, and not just uh, acceptable, but truly world-class, cutting-edge care on the battlefield. In order to recruit and retain these professionals, to acculturate them into service in the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the Marines, and the Joint Medical Force, and to maintain their skills in peacetime and in wartime, we maintain what we call a direct care system of military hospitals, health centers, and clinics. The direct care system delivers a robust health care benefit to active duty soldiers, family members, and retirees who live within a reasonable commuting distance to our military treatment facilities. For an Army at war, care of our families is critical. The warrior must know that he or she, his or her family is safe and is being cared for, and the warrior and their families must be confident that if that warrior is injured or ill in the course of their duties, that they're going to survive, they're going to return home, and that they'll have the best chance at full recovery in an active or productive life, either in uniform or out. Each service maintains responsibility for operating and managing our portion of the direct care system, our military clinics and hospitals, our graduate medical education programs, and graduate programs in general, our medic training platforms are all the cornerstone of Army Medicine's three-pronged mission to first promote, sustain, and enhance soldier health, train, develop, and equip a medical force that supports full-spectrum operations, deliver leading-edge health services to our warriors and military family to optimize the clinical outcomes for those, for those events. For those health care services not available in a military treatment facility and for those beneficiaries who don't live near a military treatment facility, we have established contractual relationships with civilian health care providers to fill those gaps. This part of the benefit is, is what we call the private sector care, or, or, or PSC, and it's managed by the TRICARE Management Agency, or TMA. The Office of the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Health Affairs, as you pointed out, sits above the direct care system and the private sector care, providing oversight and policy development. In a nutshell, the MHS exists to support warfighters on the battlefield. The direct care system exists to deliver medical readiness. Private sector care supports and fills the gaps in the direct care system. If form is to follow function, then the MHS should be optimally organized to support the direct care system. I don't believe this is always the case. For example, in the budgeting process, private sector care forecasts are considered must pay, while direct care system estimates are considered, considered unfunded requirements. The department's priority has been to fund the private sector care at 100% of projected requirements, while many of our direct care system needs are not addressed until year-end when over-forecasted PSC funding becomes available for distribution to the direct care system. Since private sector care is often over-programmed, they return money to the MHS and they're seen as cost-containing. Our direct care system health care bills are always after the fact and are seen as cost overruns. This resourcing construct appears to prioritize private sector care over the direct care system. I believe that Health Affairs, TMA, and the Service Surgeons Generals need to take a, a, a holistic look at the MHS to ensure that our functional relationships, such as those for resourcing, adoption of shared evidence-based practices between the direct care system and the purchase care system, uh, optimal documentation and exchange of clinical and other information, are all oriented towards support of the direct care system and that the organizational structure of the MHS follows accordingly. Uh, in closing, I'd like to uh, take this last opportunity to pro possibly publicly recognize my friend and colleague, Major General uh, Elder Granger. Uh, he's a respected, gifted leader and clinician. He's a soldier medic uh, par excellence. It's truly been a privilege to serve with Elder 
to be mentored by him, by him the, the nation is, tr is truly richer for his service. Thank you for holding this hearing, ma'am, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Admiral Robbins. Good morning. Chairwoman Davis, Ranking Member Wilson, distinguished members of the committee, I'm grateful to have the opportunity to share Navy Medicine's opinion about the current organization of the Office of the Secretary of Defense for Health Affairs and the TRICARE Management Activity Organization. Navy Medicine is focused on meeting current operational and humanitarian mission requirements while proactively planning to meet the future health care needs of the Navy and the Marine Corps. These two distinct services have different needs, missions, and operational requirements which require us to develop unique enhancements to our strategic ability, operational reach, and technical flexibility. Much has been accomplished between Navy Medicine and the MHS, MHS yet exigencies within the current environment require us to re-examine these organizations and the working relationships responsible for providing health care for wounded service members and their families. The experiences throughout my entire Navy career over 30 years, including a tour at Health Affairs, have shaped my position on our relationship with OSDHA and TMA. Given that background, I am increasingly concerned that the lines between policy and execution have become blurred and may be compromising the effectiveness of this combined health care organization. As Ms. Embry mentions in her testimony, the Deputy Assistant Secretaries are dual-hatted in developing policy at HA and in executing that policy at TMA. Having one controlling activity and authority over MHS policy and execution means that checks and balances can be compromised. These conflicting roles create challenges for the services since they blur execution decisions that then become policy decisions that may compromise care to our operational forces and our beneficiaries. This structure al also further divides the delivery of the benefit into two parts, in-house and network care, as General Schoomaker has outlined. Why should we, what should be a collaborative process oftentimes becomes a competitive process. HATMA's oversight of the network assets available through the TRICARE Managed Care Support Contract limits Navy Medicine from leveraging those network providers at their disposal. Navy Medicine supports a regionalized government pl governance plan with a flag officer or a general officer providing oversight for direct and purchase care services, that is, controlling the network assets. Each of the services would lead one region, a model similar to what is currently in place with the leadership of the TRICARE regional offices. This model provides the tools at the regional level to integrate direct and private sector care with the goal of optimizing care within the medical treatment facilities. Also, the ability to use network providers within the medical treatment facility may decrease the reliance of MTFs on contract support brought in to fill vacancies created by operational requirements. I've also grown increasingly concerned about the way ahead in relationship to the JTF Cat Med organization and the San Antonio Regional Medical Center, uh, Regional Military Medical Center. It is unclear to me why these two organizations are being organized differently if the intent, as stated in Dr. Chu's memo from June of 2007, suggests that in both organizations, the services would retain operational control of individual MTFs and all deployable personnel. The advisory role the services currently play in the policy-making process limits their ability to effectively implement, uh, to effectively uh, impact the process. This limited role results in concerns and or challenges not always being addressed when the final policy is disseminated. The services must be afforded a more active and influential role in the process. It is difficult for the services to have the responsibility to execute a policy and to be held accountable for said execution without the ability to affect and or influence the policy. Chairwoman Davis, I am proud to say that Navy Medicine is built on a solid foundation of traditions and a remarkable legacy of force health protection. We are committed to preparing healthy and fit sailors and Marines to protect our nation and to be ready to deploy at any time. We could not accomplish our diverse mission on our own 
So our relationship with health affairs and with the TRICARE management activity is critical to our success. I hope my testimony provides you with the examples of how strengthening the relationship between HATMA and Navy Medicine, and for that matter, the service medical uh, departments, through increased cooperation, directly benefits our sailors, airmen, soldiers, Marines, and their families. Thank you very much. Thank you. General Orbush. Good morning, Madam Chairwoman Davis, Ranking Member Wilson, distinguished members. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to share our thoughts with you this morning regarding this very important subject. Uh, before I begin, I would like to join my colleagues in recognizing the extraordinary service of Dr. Ward Cassells, who has been a key member of this organization, a key member of our team for the last two years. Uh, and I think uh, his contributions are certainly something that uh, I have appreciated, uh, I have learned, uh, we have worked together, and I think we have all profited from his presence. Likewise, General Granger has been an extraordinary ally and partner in meeting some very demanding circumstances, and I, I could not be uh, more pleased to have the chance to simply say thank you for the record for General Granger and his service. Uh, as we meet this morning, Madam Chairwoman, uh, I think it's important to understand that we operate as a team. Uh, each one of us has a role, but in order to execute effectively, we have to execute as a team. And in order to meet the critically important and very demanding military health care mission, uh, we must, we must operate as that team. And on the team, we each have roles. Uh, for health affairs, the role is policy, oversight, guidance, coordination, uh, setting that strategic vector, and as we always work for our civilian leadership uh, to give us the lead in terms of many of our activities. Uh, TMA, as their role, is to manage and execute the defense health program, which is a challenging construct, somewhat different than you'll find in other de uh, departments and agencies, uh, but uh, an activity uh, that very much drives uh, a good bit of our, our uh, energy and uh, focus in making sure that we get that particular aspect of resourcing correct. And of course, TMA uh, is our executive agency that oversees the managed care support contract, our private sector care allies and partners in delivering the full and comprehensive benefit to our active duty men and women and their family members, our retirees, those who have fought the fight, and their family members as well. For the services we have as our role, uh, a multifaceted responsibility. First, we support our chief and our secretary in providing them a healthy fit force and supporting their Title X mission uh, in executing our national military strategy. Secondly, we support our separate service missions. For we in the Air Force, we support the Air Force mission here in the United States and globally, again, serving our nation. Thirdly, we support our com uh, combatant commander's requirements. Uh, meeting their mission around the world in a variety of very challenging contingencies. And lastly, of course, uh, each uh, medical service has organizational training and equipping responsibility to be sure that the medics of today are able to meet that mission as well as the medics of tomorrow. So the services have a role, TMA has a role, HA has a role, and if we each execute those roles properly, the end result will be effective health care to the men and women so richly deserving that. I came into my position as the deputy surgeon one month before 911. I served as deputy surgeon until I assumed the role of Surgeon General in 2006. So I have some experience as a member of this team. Over that time, I have seen good men and women working hard to meet a very challenging mission, and we must never forget that. As I watched this team execute, uh, I observed over that time, as we all are aware today and has been pointed out, uh, that health affairs uh, began to take on more of execution responsibilities by merging with the TRICARE management activity. Uh, and with an increasing focus uh, on the execution within the direct care system. Now, we all work hard to execute our responsibilities, but uh, we each have our lane, our roles, responsibilities, and we need to be able to move within that lane to effectively accomplish those responsibilities. As we fast forward to this point in time, our direct care system 
the service military medical system army navy and air force is heavily tasked in meeting our critically important mission of providing that healthy fit force caring for our families and meeting the needs of our combatant commanders and our war fighters we're doing it well but it is a heavily tasked construct and there is stress within the system adding to that stress are challenges in recruiting and retention as well as recapitalizing aging infrastructure that was designed to meet the mission of the past and not necessarily designed to meet the mission of today and at the same time we are working hard to be cost effective because we understand that military health care is becoming an ever increasing large part of the department of defense budget and we have the responsibility to be great stewards of that health care in providing the best return on every dollar so i believe now is the right time to assure that we are properly aligned as a team to meet this function h a focused on policy oversight and guidance the services focused on those title ten requirements meeting our service missions meeting the combatant commanders mission and i would suggest t m a focused on managing the defense health program as they have in the past but really honing in on the managed care support contract to leverage the direct care system as very strongly recommended by the task force on the future military health care to be sure that the direct care system is the focus of our system that its capacity is fully utilized that its capabilities are fully leveraged and that it is in fact fully maintained and optimized to meet the very challenging mission so in short i believe the time is right we owe this to every man and woman who raises their right hand and swears to support and defend we owe them the very best health care today tomorrow ten years from now thirty years from now and we owe them that health care in those demanding places where they go in harm's way such that we will in fact save their life bring them home safely to their family member if that's at all possible and assure them that their health care needs will be met and will be our priority we will earn that trust today tomorrow and every day coming with your support and i thank you for this opportunity to testify and i look forward to your questions thank you major general granger and once again thank you very much for your service thank you good morning madam chairwoman davis ranking member wilson other members of the committee and to my distinguished colleagues to my right here want to thank you for your kind compliments i really enjoyed my thirty two years of active service and total thirty six years include my time start of arkansas national guard i've had the awesome responsibility serving as the deputy director of tri care management activity and in this role my responsibility been to work with my colleagues and integrate the program for nine point four men and women now point four million men and women around the world we've done a number of things through your help and support we've been able to put in a very aggressive robust disease management program that has reached out over fifty thousand and netted us netted a cost of what is about thirty million in addition to that we've had a heavy focus on meeting meeting the needs of men and women of our guard reserves in remote areas by working with our colleagues to our right as well as reaching out to those family members in terms of mental health support having a toll free number they can get help any time seven days a week three sixty five a year in addition to that thanks to you all we've been able to focus on prevention to your help will be able to put in a very robust prevention program where there are no co-pays or deductibles designed to eliminate some of those barriers that we need to get to health care in this nation. And last but not least, we have been ranked for six years in a row the number one health plan in the nation. That in itself is due to complement all us working together, focusing total on the mission of taking care of the men and women of our uniformed services. Last but not least, as I take off the uniform, it has truly been my honor to serve my colleagues for many, many years. And I look forward to your questions, Madam Chairman and Ranking Member Wilson. Those conclude my brief statement. Thank you very much, and God bless you all. Thank you very much. We appreciate all of, all of your uh, testimony here today. I think there are a number of themes that you've really identified, and one is the re proper relationship uh, between health affairs and, and TMA. And uh, I want to just zero in for a second on, on General Schoonmaker on one of your statements, and, and I know that others will will want to weigh in as well. You describe private sector care as a gap filler. Uh, but since the purchase care budget is roughly double that of the direct care budget, hasn't private sector care then really become the main effort or at least in terms of the budget? How has that impacted care and does there need to be a shift back towards the direct care system? 
Well, man, there's no question that as, as we've uh, uh, continued in this war, as we've continued to mobilize National Guard and Reserves, as we've continued to, uh, uh, to employ the private sector care to close the gaps in, in the so-called white space uh, of America where care needs to be delivered and we don't have facilities, uh, we see more private sector dollars being spent out there. And uh, I don't uh, dispute the fact, I mean, the, the, the figures speak for themselves, that, mm -hmm. that more and more money is going in that direction. Uh, but uh, I started off my comments, and uh, I was gratified to hear that my colleagues are all in agreement with this, that at the end of this, we have to always remember that the centerpiece for mil the military health system is the direct care system, and our ability to uh, to fully employ um, each one of our uh, military treatment facilities in whatever form that that, that exists uh, to the fullest extent possible. Uh, could, could you uh, and, and others paint a picture of how you think that relationship might be better developed? Well, ma'am, I think in those catchment areas, and the, the Army experimented th with this very, very early in the course of uh, the, the transitioning to a comprehensive managed care, ba primary care based managed care system, uh, placing military commanders uh, in those uh, uh, communities, uh, in catchment areas, uh, uh, in control of and responsible for both the direct care and the purchase care system. And then on a regional basis, like my colleague uh, Admiral Robinson has pointed out, having a military commander responsible for both execution of the direct care dollar and, and care as well as the purchase care dollar and b building seamlessness, not, not only in terms of where money is spent, but also in terms of practices and exchange of clinical information. I'm, I'm, I'm firmly one who believes that the, our future in cost containment is going to reside around our ability to embrace outcomes-focused, evidence-based practices. And that's done, I think, best in, in concert and, and through the military commander. Mm -hmm. Others want to comment, uh, and because do you think that the fact that that relationship perhaps doesn't exist today, that that's that's not where the the balance is, uh, that that gets in the way of of doing what you think is is best? I think that the relationship does exist today, but I think the emphasis is not on the relationship of of trying to bring the direct care system and the managed care system, the network together. There is a there is a system that keeps us in parallel, but we're to like two parallel railroad tracks. What we need to do, and this is the task force uh, of the future military health care, the number one recommendation was to bring together the, the direct care system, that's the uniform side, and the managed care side into, a, into the same system. Instead of taking our patients and sending them to the network, the network is our network. We need to bring our networks to our MTFs. We need to bring, we need to merge a lot of the activities that are occurring in parallel in our system. But in fact, very often the direct care side, that is the MTF commanders, really don't have visibility on what is occurring on the network side. I'm not suggesting that they don't understand what the policies for accessing the net network are or how to do that. I'm suggesting that we don't really have a system that leverages our networks mm -hmm. so that it can help us on can the direct care be side. Before we go on to the, um, to the next member, I just wanted, Ms. Embry, could you weigh in uh, on this question a little bit? Do you, because you, you said that basically under Title 10 that, that um, the Secretary defines the roles and responsibilities, and I think there's some question whether or not that's actually uh, really uh, not quite as, as, as you, as you um, characterized it. Could you? Please weigh in on that issue. I think that uh, the, the segregation has to do a little bit with how money is, se is segregated. We have, uh, we have to budget and there's a firewall between what we can, you know, we have to budget for what our uh, beneficiary population uh, seeks in the way of care in our network and we also have to budget for what we believe um, the performance and productivity and demand signals in our military treatment facilities. And there is a firewall. We can't move money back and forth uh, easily without a reprogramming request. So I think part of it is artificial, institutional, and part of it is um, 
you know, we, we attempted, I believe, to establish uh, TRICARE regional offices, uh, and when we originally s established them uh, from 11 regional areas to three, we asked each of the service surgeons general to identify uniformed flag officers to manage that so that we could get to that uniformed integration of uh, and support in a regional area that kind of integration that was testified to. Um, to date, the Navy has been the only one consistently providing that uniformed officer. Yeah. Th thank you. I know that we're going to come, come back to that issue. Mr. Wilson? Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Again, thank you all for being here, and I want to congratulate you. I believe that military medicine is leading the world in technology, uh, research. Uh, it, it's so inspiring to me to know uh, what you are doing and advancing, uh, and I visited the medical facilities of, with prosthetics, with uh, head injury, uh, trauma injury. Uh, what helps the, the military will also be so helpful to the civilian population, and I want to thank you for what you've done. Uh, specifically, as a uh, veteran and a parent, I this month visited the uh, Air Force Hospital there at uh, Balad, and it was really encouraging to me to know that there is a 98% survival rate of uh, our troops who are medevaced uh, to that hospital. I just think that is uh, so reassuring, and the American people need to know the quality of care uh, that's provided. Uh, specifically, prior to establishing the Defense Health Program, funding, and this is for our Surgeons, surgeons General, um, funding for health care provided by the military services was included in the overall military service budget managed by the service secretary. Consequently, the Surgeons General had to compete with other programs within their service for resources. Now that you've had several years of experience with the Defense Health Program, what method do you prefer in light of the current health care demands within DOD? What is the most appropriate mechanism for allocating resources between direct care and purchase care system? Sir, as, as we have had experience with the, uh, the DHP, uh, we have two streams of resources. We have the, the dollars coming through the DHP, and we have the manpower, which comes through our, our service secretaries. Uh, we have, I believe, uh, established a system which in the main serves our purposes but does create some tension uh, in terms of allocating resources. Uh, I, I will tell you that uh, my view is I think there is some rationale with the DHP in terms of looking at health care resources writ large uh, with uh, across three services uh, and a very large military health system. Uh, I will tell you that the countervailing uh, pressure on that, though, uh, is, is my chief and my secretary who view the health of, of their men and women, our airmen, and their families as very much uh, their responsibility within their Title X responsibilities. Uh, so I'm, I feel very well supported by my line in terms of competing for resources and uh, properly allocating uh, those very scarce resources uh, across my activities. Uh, the DHP is a balancing construct uh, to a certain extent, and it does allow us to get at uh, the larger cost, potentially, of the private sector care, which goes across services. That's not necessarily a simply service-specific uh, issue, although within catchment areas uh, it, it can get very local, but in the main, uh, in being able to manage very large contracts, uh, we do need to do that strategically from a corporate standpoint, and I think the DHP gives us the opportunity to do that. I agree with my, uh, my colleagues, however, that balancing between the direct care system and private sector care uh, is very challenging. The direct care system uh, to your point, Madam Chairwoman, uh, is in fact the centerpiece and does actually three things. It helps us provide that healthy fit force. Uh, it allows us to provide the, ben the benefit to all our beneficiaries to the full extent that we can, but it's also our training platform for our, our military medical personnel. So the direct care system uh, needs to be uh, robust and the centerpiece. 
Now, the private sector care wraparound to that needs to be in balance, and I agree with my colleagues that uh, the direct care system needs to be Trump with private sector care being used to leverage uh, the direct care system and also to leverage the capacity because the direct care system in many regards is sunk cost. So the greater capacity we have within the direct care system, the more cost effective our system is overall. So I think the DHP in the main allows us to get at that. Uh, there is some tension uh, with that. However, uh, my chief, my secretary pay very close attention to that balance and that tension. Uh, which I think helps us keep some some uh, rationality and balance within it, uh, but it does create tensions. Thank sure. you very much. And, uh, and General Schoomaker may want to comment too. I'll just say very quickly, sir, I think uh, unequivocally from my perspective, the, the creation of the DHP by the Atwood Memorandum was, was a good thing. Uh, and, and to go back through the door of, of breaking uh, health care costs uh, uh, among the services, I think would be uh, a back backward step to take. Uh, it's allowed us to see, uh, to, to develop a level playing field to the best of our ability across services. It's allowed us to raise to the uh, much higher level of visibility the needs of, of our, our beneficiaries uh, for care and, and for all of the uh, even deployment related uh, issues that we have. Um, I, I think what you're hearing, and, and I c completely agree with, uh, with General Radebush, is you're hearing a seri series of tensions. One, the tension between the direct care system and the purchase care system and where that should be balanced. And the other is the, the balance between oversight and, and policy development by health affairs and execution by the services. And increasingly, we're seeing uh, health affairs take on the role of execution. And in, in doing that, I think uh, it erodes some of the goodness of the DHP. I, too, agree with, uh, with my colleagues on the DHP. It would be wrong. I think it would be a major mistake to go back from, from to any other system other than the DHP. Service input into how the DHP, how that DOD program is, in fact, executed is the tension that I think I would like to just comment on. And the services need to have some direct input into the processes of how the DHP is executed. In recent years, that hasn't always been as clearly demonstrated to me. Uh, I'm not suggesting it hasn't occurred. I just haven't been able to clearly see the occurrence of it. So I think that that's where we should, we, we should uh, look at it. But I would not change the, the, the system that we've developed now. Thank you. Very encouraging. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Schneider? Thank you all, Madam Chair, and thank you all for being here. I, I want to direct um, my questions to, to the three of you that hold the title of Surgeon General. I'm phrasing it that way because I don't know if the plural is Surgeons General or Surgeon Generals. Is it Surgeons General? Huh? Um, this is one of those discussions this morning that is, is probably uh, a very, very important one to a lot of our men and women in uniform and their families. It's just, it's, it's one of these discussions, while important, can give government a bad name because it comes across as a bunch of gobbledygook that most of us don't understand. And I, I, I appreciate you for being as forthcoming as you are and trying to sort it out and, and make recommendations. But I, I want to try to, I want to give you a couple of uh, theoreticals and or, uh, little anecdotal things and have you, the three of you, if you would walk me through how you, this tension that you all are describing, how it may actually impact on patient care. I, I'm going to throw out a couple examples and then you can uh, tell me if it doesn't have anything to do with it or, or examples of what you're talking about. The first example is of special needs kids. I think some of us have talked about before. Uh, uh, General Schumacher, you talked about uh, supporting our war fighters overseas and I think nothing creates more heartache for our folks overseas than if they have a special needs kid and they and the kid is not getting the kind of care that they think they need while they're at a at a military facility someplace. So let's take a, either a kid, say, with, you know, insulin-dependent diabetes or autism or something that requires a fairly intensive amount of, of, of help. The second example might be that I think a lot of us have run into over the last several years would be a uh, somebody in the reserve component who is mobilized for active duty for a period of 18 months or so. Their family then goes I into the military health care system but may geographically be living in a place not near a base, not near providers who are used to dealing with TRICARE. 
So what I'd like each of you to do, and just tell me if I'm off base, and maybe that the tensions we're talking about or you all discussing today have nothing to do with those examples, but how does what you're talking about relate specifically to our men and women and the, the care that they give? And if these are a couple of examples where it may, it may give you an opportunity to describe how the tension may relate to uh, the actual care that men and women and their families get. Well, candidly, sir, I mean, th from my perspective, both of the, the cases, and I'd be interested in hearing what my colleagues have to say, both of those cases, I, I think, uh, are not necessarily um, uh, confounded by the tensions that we're creating here. In fact, I think both of them, in many cases, are a tribute to the farsightedness uh, and the vision of, of setting up a TRICARE system as we did 15 years ago or so. In the case of special needs kids, we, we have an extraordinarily be uh, generous benefit which is fairly uniformly applied. And uh, in fact, I think it's, re it's, it's, it's resulted in, in the, the military health care system being one of the elements of a family's decision with a special needs child to stay uh, in uniform. So I, I would have to say that uh, that, that ne doesn't necessarily, I don't see my role in, uh, in executing these programs as being interfered with in any way, shape, or form in taking care of special needs kids. I would have to say the same about the, the mobilized reserve component, National Guard and Reserve, uh, many of whom come from uh, places I in this country uh, where we don't have a, a robust direct care system. Um, you know, central Idaho, uh, uh, parts of Montana, Wyoming, we, we don't have large, uh, robust medical centers and health systems. And so having uh, an, an effective purchase care system and a managed care support contractor that is uh, reaching out and providing care to, to those families, I think, is uh, again reflects the farsightedness of a, of a, a well executed TRICARE uh, program. Uh, I, I'm not taking away from I any of that part of it. I, I would come at this a little differently. I, I, don't, com I don't completely disagree with uh, General Schoomaker. But I think that the autism and the insulin dependent diabetic uh, do come into play in this regard. Uh, often, f first of all, the private sector care, the network care, and the uh, direct care uh, can both play here. Uh, let's take 29 Palms. I'll just take a Marine Corps base in Southern California, very remote location. Uh, I'm not going to be able to get network care there. It's going to have to be direct care. It's going to have to be uniform care. Uh, now, when I say I can't get it, there are people that will go there, but that's very difficult. So I have places in this country that are very difficult to, in, to, in fact, get network care. That means I need it in uniform. However, very often there's also been, and, and I, I don't want to get caught in the mire of the gobbledygook, but there's also thoughts that very often we on the direct care side in uniform should be there for very specialized warfighting activities that make us I I incredibly essential for the battle and for the things that the military system, in fact, was built to do, but in fact in 2009 we have taken on added responsibilities which include garrison and family care. So my question then is, I need pediatric endocrinologists as much as I need trauma surgeons, but it may be difficult sometimes to in fact get there because of how we have in fact looked at what we think we should get from the warfighting versus the non-warfighting situation. Now I'm not suggesting to you that anyone's denying uh, the Navy or the other services, pediatric endocrinologists. I'm just simply saying that there is a tension that does exist because of some thoughts and some uh, assumptions made as to how we really should, in fact, divvy up our, our uniform versus our network. I'd, I'd like to add just one other thing. I'm, I'm not going to comment on the reserve component. Uh, I think that General Schoomaker's answer is, is w would be mine also. I'd only like to say overseas, with our EDIS, Exceptional Developmental Instructional s Programs, and also our Exceptional Family Member Programs. This is also the case because overseas, we're not able to, to in fact, engage in that work care. So if I don't have it, if I can't either contract it to bring it, or if I don't have it in uniform, it's much more difficult to get. And those are just challenges that I must look at. I'm not suggesting that anyone's keeping me from getting there. But these are the challenges from SG's perspective that I must look at. Congressman, I, I think you raise a point that, that really brings out the essence of what we're talking about this morning. There, there is a role and relationship, and it's not either or, it's and. Uh, for us uh, in uniform, 
there are in fact places where we are going to need to have in uniform specialty capabilities for family members because family care is mission impact when our men and women are in harm's way if they're not confident their families are fully cared for it they will not be focused on what's in front of them and and that has mission impact so family care plays directly into the mission for us uh, tri care uh, gives us that wrap around in, in those circumstances where we may not have the capability readily available for our reserves in areas where we don't have a facility available, for example, uh, or for special needs uh, youngsters, we may not have that readily available within the uniform service. TRICARE gives us that wraparound capability and, and quite frankly, when you get to specialty care for, for our youngsters, uh, that is rather expensive to make uh, and sustain in uniform. And the more cost-effective solution and clinically effective solution in many circumstances is in fact to contract for that, that capability and that care uh, through the private sector, TRICARE. So it's not either or, it's and and finding the right balance, uh, each of us within our roles to get that mission accomplished. So I, I, I think you do raise an intersection that's critically important for us to get right. Thank you. I'm going to move on. Uh, Ms. Hongas? Thank you. I'm, I'm enjoying this testimony, and I have to say much of this is, as a new member, a relatively new member, much of it is very new to me. Uh, I have to say, it, many years ago, as a child of the Air Force, I uh, needed um, a, a very delicate eye surgery. And I was in an Air Force hospital in, at Langley Air Base and then subsequently at Tajikawa Air Base. Uh, and I received remarkable care. Uh, and again, I was with Congressman Wilson uh, in Balad where we did see the remarkable work that you're doing. But obviously we're in a, in a, a time in an era when health care is far more complicated and far more expensive. Uh, and it's clear that you're wrestling with both on multiple layers. My question, slightly different though, is uh, we have representatives of the different services and you obviously uh, have different cultures, sometimes very different needs as a result of the roles you play. And I'm just curious how this plays itself out given the different tensions that uh, you all have described. Is it another layer to it or is it, uh, is it really not particularly significant? Well, I'll speak for the Army. I, I think, ma'am, it's very significant. And, and I think it's why uh, we, uh, not for parochialism or not uh, because we're looking to build duplication or triplication uh, within, within the, the defense health system, uh, why we insist on executing our programs within each one of our services. Uh, each one of the services, for very, very good reasons, uh, has uh, important differences in how it fights war uh, and how uh, its military health care uh, uh, uniform members support the deployed force. And uh, that's not to say that there aren't commonalities. And in, in some large metropolitan areas, like in the National Capital Region or San Antonio, we can't find shared platforms where we can retain common skills, where we can uh, uh, share the, the, the opportunities in the greater Washington area where we, where we have 36 or 37 uh, different um, health care facilities across the three services from Pennsylvania down to Quantico and as far west as, uh, as uh, Fort Belvoir. We, we have plenty of opportunities to share those platforms for, for caring for about a half million beneficiaries. But when it comes down to ships at sea and, uh, and uh, brigades in, in, in battle, uh, some of the remote sites that uh, General Radebush and, and I and the Army have to uh, service, uh, the service cultures are, are very, very much a, a part of this. And, and, and it's why we, as uh, service surgeons general and commanders of our medical forces, uh, want to have a, a very firm grasp on the execution of these programs. Each service has uh, a, a concept of care I think that as the long war has continued uh, in both Iraq and Afghanistan, our concepts of care have actually become much closer together. They've merged. From the Navy's perspective, I'm not speaking now for the Army the Air Force, but I don't think they're much different. Patient and family-centered care is our concept, 
it's what we think is important in order to make sure that we can meet the mission both the operational that is the war mission as well as the family in the garrison care mission because we can't separate them out any longer since people on the battlefield men and women can now email and text message family members during uh, an intense encounter it is no longer the case that I can in fact not take care of families as I'm also taking care of men and women on the battlefield we've moved into another era of communication of technology and of the insistence by the people that are our beneficiaries that we in fact care for them in a very organized and meaningful way and that's what I think all three services do but we all do it differently leveraging those things that our service chiefs and the equities of Army Navy Air Force and Marine Corps must have in order to meet their missions and at the same time making sure that we leave no patient no family and no member behind and and, and not to interrupt but do the health affairs and TRICARE management acknowledge this in in your relationships or is it yet one more one of those things that again is a source of tension I think that health affairs does acknowledge that I think that they do in fact understand that the differences in in the services and how to meet them I also think that very often the concept of what is important from a patient perspective can get can sometimes get clouded or get shaded in relationship to the business perspective of efficiencies and effectiveness now that's the world that we live in so I'm not complaining to you about that because everyone has to look at cost and has to look at the bottom line that we're trying to get done the key here in medicine is that patients usually when they're coming to you and they need something to save their life they need something that they think is going to be absolutely essential to their well-being are not interested in hearing the business gurus involved in doing that my job is to in fact take that into account and to balance that out with the needs of the patient. Jim, do you want to comment? Just very quickly, uh, at, at times folks will, will talk about culture and say, well, <laughs> culture is interesting. Uh, I would suggest to you that culture is a significant part of what we do. We have an all volunteer force. Every soldier joins the Army because he or she is attracted to the mission and the culture. Likewise, every sailor, Marine, and Airman joins that service because they are attracted to the culture and the mission. Their families are wrapped in that culture. We care for our servicemen and their families within that culture and within that mission ethos. So culture is a big part, and particularly when these men and women are injured or ill, that culture wraps around them and supports them, helps them through that recovery, rehabilitation. So it does play a role. And while some of the, uh, many of the clinical activities are certainly the same in the Army, Navy, and the Air Force, uh, that, that wraparound, that family, that team uh, that's caring for them is an important part of the construct. And I think that can't be lost in the discussion. Thank you. Mr. Jones. Madam Chairman, thank you very much. And uh, I regret that I was not here for your opening statements, but I do appreciate what you're doing. It's a very difficult time for our men and women in uniform, certainly a very difficult time for our nation, and certainly health care for the private sector as well as the military sector is at the forefront of any many discussions here in Washington as well as debates. Um, Admiral Robson, I want to thank you. You and your staff did a very excellent job of responding to a question I had about autism and autism programs down at Camp Lejeune. And, um, I was very much an, a, appreciative of the information and the work that you all are doing, quite frankly. And as I've heard many from each services talking about the fact that uh, the world is becoming more complicated. Uh, it looks like we're going to be in Afghanistan for a long period of time. I hope not, but it looks that way. Uh, and therefore, there, there's going to be more stress and pressure on the military families. And in a response, and this is not a criticism, but you realize that as a member of, of Congress, we have our districts, we have people in our districts, both military and non-military, that have questions about services and programs for families. And I, again, was very pleased and satisfied with the response that you gave me to the questions that we ask in behalf of parents down at Camp Lejeune. But the only point I want to make and ask you this question, uh, and 
I know you don't have this before you, but we asked the question was, uh, how many of the above dependents are enrolled in the TRICARE ECHO program as of 12-31-08? Please break down your response by location, Camp Lejeune and San Diego. I won't go through your response, I don't want to get to the question. Uh, then you gave me that answer with, with the numbers, which was helpful, because obviously there are more children in that San Diego uh, area with the Navy base in Camp Pendleton than they would be at Camp Lejeune. Uh, but still, we have children uh, with autism at Camp Lejeune. So the next question was, how many of the above uh, dependents are receiving ABA services under the TRICARE Enhanced Autism Service uh, Demonstration as of 12-31-08? Please break down your response by location. Uh, <clears throat> the response was, um, there are 118 dependents receiving applied behavioral analysis, excuse me, services, 68 Navy families and 50 Marine families uh, for the San Diego, San Diego and Camp Pendleton catchment area. There are no dependents receiving AB services under the TRICARE Enhancement Autism Service Demonstration in Naval Hospital Camp Lejeune, uh, Naval uh, Health Clinic Cherry Point, and Marine Corps Air Station New River. So then the next question, now I'm going to get to the, the final. Uh, how many ABA therapist pro providers are serving military families in Camp Lejeune catchment area uh, under the Autism Service Demonstration Project, how many providers have signed on in the San Diego area? This is the question I was trying to get to. There are no ABA network providers in the Naval Hospital Camp Lejeune area. There are 10 ABA uh, supervisors and 82 ABA tutors serving military families in the San Diego area. I'm not being critical because again, we all know what the numbers game is. It, I mean, we are all under stress uh, here in Congress as well as you in the military. My point would be though, uh, realizing there are more children in that San Diego area, that fact that we have none at Camp Lejeune, can that be reevaluated? And I mean, not saying that we need to have the equal numbers of, of the professionals uh, at Camp Lejeune that we have at San Diego or Camp Pendleton, but to say that we have none is somewhat of concern, not only to the parents down there, but also to myself. Is that something that can be reviewed to see if the justification, realizing the restraints you're under, but is there any way that we can see if we can get some of those profession, professionals, excuse me, at the Navy Hospital at Camp Lejeune? Well, well, Mr. Jones, thank you very much for your, your compliments and, and also the fact that we've been working with your staff on some of these issues for a while, and, and I appreciate that. The answer is yes, it can be reviewed. The, the second answer is that the the fact that there are none uh, may not tell the complete story because there may be other sources right, of, true. of that type of therapy that the children can receive. Uh, thirdly, the amount of contractors and people who will, who will go and who will actually uh, uh, stop in, in Jacksonville, North Carolina, Vice, San Diego, California. Uh, and that does make, so the geographic area does make a difference. Bottom line though, sir, to you is that we in Navy Medicine and actually we in Military Health System are absolutely committed to children wherever they may be, no matter what their location. So we will revisit that and look at that. I, I happen to know that the system that we have in Camp Lejeune is more complicated than the numbers you suggest because of differences in the, in the network uh, emphasis on certain of the, uh, of the behavioral health assets, how we are in fact uh, deciding who can deliver that ABA care, uh, who is involved. Uh, there, there are a number of, 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 of facets to that particular question. But yes, sir, we can look at that again. And thank we will, in fact. Thank you, Admiral. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Fallon? Thank you, Madam Chairman. Appreciate all that you do for our nation and delivery of medical care to our servicemen and women. I know it's tough under limited financial constraints that you have and so many uh, different regions of the world that you have to deliver care. I was just uh, curious about, because we've had so many men and women serving more, probably more than ever in, in deployments across the world and with the events after 9-11 and the fight on terrorism and the large numbers of men and women who've been called up, when they start to come back home to the United States, you're, you're going to have a lot of veterans and a lot of soldiers who will be going into the healthcare system for many different reasons 
whether it is just regular care from injuries or regular medical care or post-traumatic stress syndrome, whatever it might be, what type of plans have we made and, and do you have the resources you need to meet all the, the large numbers of people that will be coming home over the next many years? Well, ma'am, I think this, I mean, that uh, th therein lies probably the biggest question we're all facing. And first of all, starting with what the estimates are of uh, the, the kinds and types of illnesses and injuries we're going to be seeing. I mean, the, the vast majority of of wounds of war, quite frankly, are not visible wounds. Uh, and and one of the major efforts that is undergoing right now within the Department of Defense is, the, is to get a grasp on what the, st the state of uh, current science and understanding of all of the neuropsychiatric uh, injuries, whether they are uh, physical injuries to the brain uh, from concussion or whether they are psychological uh, consequences of, of deployment and exposure to, to war and the like. Uh, we, we have conducted in the, in the military health system uh, through epidemiologists uh, out of the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research over the last six years uh, a recurring a uh, fairly uh, tight scientific study called the, uh, for the Army and, and the Marine Corps a, a mental health advisory team which has done estimates of, of what the volume of uh, problems is and what the nature of those problems are and, and when they emerge. And that's helped us. We work very closely with the VA to do the, to, to then, and our TRICARE managed care support contractors to ensure that we have the network of care available both within the federal system and within the private care, uh, care system. But I think this is something that all of us, it keeps all of us up at, at night. Do you feel like your new proposal on, on your system, the changes that you're talking about in, in your hearing today will move you closer to that goal? Well, ma'am, I, 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 this kind of overlaps with the, the question that the Congresswoman Sangas had about the acknowledgement of the cultural differences and the challenges to each of the services. Uh, frankly, at my level of command, uh, acknowledgement uh, is, is represented in dollars. And uh, as I said in my opening statement earlier, um, when, when I find my budget not programmable in a predictable way, but private sector care programmable, then I have a, tr a very difficult time developing a stable business platform for, for my medical treatment facilities, which um, I'm compelled to give a lot of my family and soldier care around. And uh, that, that's uh, a great deal of the tension that we've talked about here this morning. One of the concerns I hear in my community and in the state of Oklahoma is how we don't have enough people to handle post-traumatic stress syndrome as far as counseling and diagnosis and psychiatry, whatever level of care it might be, that we don't have those people on board yet and there's a shortage and it's hard to get that care in the local states and, and what are we going to do to address those things? Is it a matter of funding? Um, the department has recognized that there is a, a national shortage to the, the citizens of America and not just the military, uh, although the military certainly has a high demand for those services. And we've been uh, given a, a fair amount of resources from Congress to assist us in expanding that capability. And we're leveraging many different approaches to include uh, bringing in social workers and other folks and tiering the capability so that um, we uh, assure that the assets that have the certifications and capabilities are dealing with those that need those services and that we uh, distribute the uh, other services to um, sometimes non-clinical but certainly qualified individuals to aid in early intervention and then referral to appropriate higher level care. Mr. Chairman, if I could just finish one last question. Someone had mentioned to me yesterday about some new research being done with, and I hope I'm saying this right, you're the physicians, hyperbaric chambers when it comes to the treatment of post-traumatic stress syndrome. Have you seen any type of, of research that might indicate it would be helpful? Ma'am, the uh, I believe what you are referring to uh, is is focused at least for the moment on uh, traumatic brain injury and uh, hyperbaric oxygen. And that, in fact, uh, is being very aggressively pursued with the Defense Center of Excellence and Psychological Health Traumatic Brain Injury uh, to really be sure that science is applied to that to assure that we have the best therapeutic modalities positioned for the men and women 
and uh, that we are able to to apply those therapies to the best outcome. So yes, ma'am, that is in the center of the scope and is being very aggressively pursued for all three services as, uh, as we all have individuals in harm's way with that particular uh, outcome uh, as, a, as a risk for these men and women. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Madam Chairman, can I come in on that station, uh, statement for a second? In reference to the families, we have stood up with our managed care support contract to partners, uh, toll-free numbers they could call, and based on data in the last three years, the number of family members using our mental health capability in our network has increased significantly. And we'd be glad to share that data with you for the record. Thank you. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. I appreciate it, the question because I think that we could, could uh, certainly have a, uh, a hearing focused solely on mental health care and, and what is happening uh, to support uh, the services that are out there, the kind of research and development um, that's being done, certain that we don't have, you know, whole spread duplication, uh, and at the same time what we're doing to really help the families be able to uh, move through this uh, problem that, that, that they're all having. And very, very important, so I, I appreciate some focus on that. I wanted to, now see, we have a vote uh, coming up, and I don't know whether folks can come back. We can try and have two more questions, and then, um, and we'll, then we'll make a decision about whether to ask you to, to, uh, to wait here. That may, that may be it. Uh, I just wanted to get back to a second uh, to the oversight question, because I, I understand the tension and the balance that we're talking about, but um, I think, General Odebus, you mentioned in your statement that in many ways, um, TMA's current level of, uh, the, the current level uh, that you mentioned of the oversight over the military treatment facility is, is fairly extensive and, and somewhat excessive as well. And I just wonder if you could talk to us more about um, what you think the right structure then for health affairs for TMA would be um, to better provide oversight to the services? Yes, ma'am. It's, it's a collaborative relationship. Uh, it really is an and. Uh, health affairs, uh, my view, my experience is uh, most effective and, and in fact uh, has it continues to be very effective at providing that strategic policy uh, guidance, the coordinating oversight to assure that we are leveraging capabilities across all three services, taking efficiencies uh, where those are certainly available to, to make the best return on every taxpayer's dollar. Uh, but in terms of how that translates into the facilities, uh, if, if you look at how we have operated in the past, uh, responsibilities have been given to the service in executive agencies, for example, uh, to perform particular functions. Some of those executive agencies have been migrated into the TRICARE management activity. Now, I won't say that's uniformly good or uniformly bad. Uh, however, uh, those kinds of responsibilities have been migrated away from the services, and uh, I, I think we need to examine very closely uh, the activities that are, are resident within TMA and resident within the services. My strategic construct is that TMA is absolutely essential in managing the DHP to make sure that we have the right ten, uh, tension and balance across competing resources uh, and in managing the managed care support contracts to be sure that the direct care system is the centerpiece and that our, our private sector care is leveraged towards that. Where do you see that discussion taking place? Are, are you saying that you don't think that the uh, that you're able to have a strong enough voice, that all of you are able to have enough strong enough voice in that discussion and that decisions are made perhaps um, irregardless of some of those wishes? Uh, uh, I think perhaps the latter. Uh, there are times that decisions are made that we don't have full visibility uh, and, and, or, and or perhaps the coordination or input that we might prefer uh, in some of those discussions and I would certainly welcome comments from my colleagues relative to that particular aspect. No, I'd have to agree. Um, I mean, candidly, w w I think uh, all too often a lack of complete unanimity opinion among the three services when it comes to um, allocation of resources or programming resources translates into um, health affairs uh, making a decision uh, on their own. And uh, that, that's an area where I don't think it's a function of structure per se, it's a function of, uh, of allocating to us a, a certain authority to, to m be uh, complete partners in this process. Um, and I, it keeps coming back for me to this 
uh, struggle that I have and my service has in developing a stable business platform for all of my hospitals when uh, when many of our needs are relegated to um, to unfunded requirements until a very late part of the fiscal year in, in, in the in the budget year it's a tough way to run business I would have to agree with that I think that uh, I can give you I can go down into the interstices of this which I am not going to do because it would not be helpful but I agree with both colleagues uh, I think that the services uh, the uh, surgeons general need to be uh, need to have uh, a say that is meaningful and the services need to have a say that's meaningful the services do not run nor is the DHP their account they are all three responsible for that DHP account and therefore they need to have some visibility of how it is executed and that is uh, absolutely important often that that has not occurred uh, in my tenure as Surgeon General mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Major General, could you comment, uh, is that by design or, or uh, what, what gets in the way of that? Well, let me tell you what gets in the way, ma'am. I, I would concur with my colleagues. What we're dealing with is policy at the health affairs level. We're talking about execution at their level, oversight, HA, TMA, well, really health affairs, and then having a feedback loop on how we work in a very collaborative way. Uh, the lines are blurred in terms of what's policy, what's execution, and what is feedback. And we is don't do that. Is it because of the reporting process? Is that it's, part of it? The, my opinion is because of the reporting process. Mm -hmm. It is not, it's not exactly what's what, because when you say H-A-T-M-A, -A, that could be all of us or none of us. That's my honest opinion. Mm -hmm. So it needs to be, you need to separate what is policy oversight, execution by the services, what is the oversight, of how to execute that and what is the feedback loop we all get to make sure we're fulfilling the needs of men and women's our uniform services. Ms. Embry or Ms. McGinn, would you like to comment? Um, I'd like to comment, yes. Um, I think. And quickly, I'm sorry, we, we just have a okay. few minutes. Um, and you can, you can write us more about that too. Go ahead. Okay, I'll tell you more in writing. <laughs> You'd rather do that. Mr. Wilson, did you? No. Mr. Wilson, do you have a question briefly? Before one, one brief uh, question to conclude. Um, the Office of the Assistant, this is for our DOD officials here. Uh, the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Defense for Health Affairs sets the policy for the MHS. The TRICARE management activity implements the policies of the MHS. However, the leadership of the two organizations are the same. Uh, what, what would be the checks and balances in, in such an organization? Checks and balances are a series of governing councils where we engage all of the principal leaders of the department at various levels. Each person who is double-hatted has an integrating council which involves representation from the service surgeons generals as well as the joint staff and the combatant commands when appropriate. Um, we engage with them on the issues and discuss the, how the current policies aren't working and how to implement new policies whether or programs, whether they're directed by Congress in law, whether report guidance, or whether or not it is the administration itself who says we need to do something differently. When we have a change in direction, as many as we've had over the last six years, we've had to leverage those integrating councils to understand what the problem is, get a common vision on way, the way forward, and to get consensus on the way to approach solving the problem in near term. And that's the way we've approached that over time. Um, we did not have available resources to be able to hire new SESs to in the TMA structure as well as the HA structure. And so we double-headed many individuals to ensure that the, fo the form followed the function, that the policy understood what the problems were, set up the programs to do it, and then set up the program evaluation and quality assurance programs necessary to make sure that when they were implemented and executed in the services, that they were accomplished in a way that, uh, that they were intended. So I believe it's been a collaborative process all along, and I, um, that's my personal opinion. And if I could add a, a 10 second uh, check and balance to that, you do have an undersecretary of defense for personnel and readiness who has responsibility to oversee the Assistant Secretary for Health Affairs, and I think also to look at the um, 
issues brought forward by the stakeholders. As I said, he or she chairs the Military Health System Executive Review. Issues can be brought to that review from the stakeholders and discussed in that forum. So there is an oversight responsibility there as well. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. I, I think there, there's, there's obviously some difference of opinion, and I think part of what we're interested in is trying to make certain that everybody is, does have an opportunity to, to express that, and we would certainly look forward to working uh, with all of you as, as we're trying to you know, sort all this out. The, the, the bottom line, as we said, is the care of the men and women who serve our country and their families, and we want to be certain that we're doing this in the most efficient way uh, that looks at cost, looks at ac access, and and care, uh, care in in, in a, a larger fashion of how people feel valued within the system. And so we appreciate uh, all of your uh, remarks today. This is the beginning of this conversation in many ways. We intend to uh, look further at it and uh, certainly appreciate your concern. Members have an opportunity to submit their questions for the record, and we um, wish you the best today. Thank you.